Big business is tough, but I believe there are certain factors that give us all a fighting chance of turning our dreams of success into reality. I'm on a mission to get inside the minds of some of Britain's most successful entrepreneurs and find out how they made it. I always knew I was going to make a few quid, you know what I mean? I don't remember really being content. Enough is never enough. I'll be studying their personalities just as hard as their business models. Maybe I need the business more than it needs me. In a bid to unearth what drives these diverse characters, I'll also be asking some difficult questions. Have you been told that you, you're mad? Well, I think there's, there's always been a very fine line between insanity and, and genius. And I'll be finding out how they survived when they faced their biggest challenges. I was so busy and I'd had this lump in my breast. So you realised you had a lump? Well, yeah, but then... You did nothing about it? No. My goal is to find out if it's our individual DNA that controls our destiny or whether there's a blueprint for success. How are you? Tonight, two successful entrepreneurs with completely contrasting backgrounds. They've both faced commercial crises where one wrong move could have destroyed all they've worked towards. I'll be meeting millionaire plumber Charlie Mullins. Is it safe? <laughs> a Londoner who's learnt to control his business the hard way. So what happens if an employee doesn't adhere to something in this Bible? They go. And Lord Karen Billamoria, the Indian owner of Cobra Beer, whose battle to save his business from collapse came at a massive cost. Was there a point where you ever felt this, this is too much? Several times you feel it's too much, but you never think of giving up. Never ever. Plumber Charlie Mullins is not your average handyman. In fact, with an estimated personal wealth of £55 million, Charlie is more likely to wear a Savile Row suit than a pair of plumber's overalls. Charlie. All right, Peter. How are you? I'm all right, mate. How are you? Fantastic. I can't believe how tall you are. But I bet if you fell over, you'd be halfway home, wouldn't you? I would, but it's a good job i got size 14 boots. <laughs> In London alone, there's nearly £500 million worth of plumbing business up for grabs. Employing over 200 people, Charlie manages to turn over £17 million a year. You can achieve things in life. It's just about, you know, believing in yourself, putting something into it, and unfortunately working hard because there ain't nothing comes without hard work. But Charlie's success is not just the result of hard work. He's faced some serious crises, and I want to find out how he survived and how he's making millions from u bends and toilets. I like this though, all the number plates. Well, we got about 150 vans on the road and I think about 140 plumbing related number plates. What would that cost, water? I think it was about £25,000. And what's the, the line-up? We have a system here, we're a clean and tidy outfit. We portray ourselves as being the, the, the best in London. You ain't putting no dirt on it, are you? <laughs> That's cleaner than my car. Well, the thing is, we've we got about four people doing the valeting all the time. There's nothing worse, Peter, than a, a plumber turning up in like a dirty old van, his ass hanging out his trousers. You know what I mean? That's the wrong image. So we send presentable people, nice, tidy vans. We're a very transparent company and offer a quality service. And um, one day I'll hopefully be as successful as you. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but wow. I don't know, though. He seems to be doing pretty well to me. But is there any substance behind that cheeky patter? I had expected to be immersed in pipes and plungers. What's your head in there, mate? But this plumber's yard looked more like a van showroom. You know, we, I think we have about four or five mechanics here. And why do you do this yourself? Well, you know yourself what mechanics can be like. Uh, this way, we're in total control of it, you know what I mean? We can work 24 hours here. We've got something off the road. Fellas are coming at night. Get it going again, do you know what I mean? Quite, you quite like to keep everything tight, don't you? Close well, to you. Yeah, I mean, we, we run a pretty tight ship and... Is it tight or is it... Um, is it controlling? Organising, I would call it, you know what I mean? Organising it. Walking around, I couldn't help feeling that it was all a little too perfect and pristine. Yeah, I'll show you uh, round to a... Uh, uh, unfortunately, this is your spray area. Spray area, yeah. Which I assume is immaculate as well. Um, what do you want me to say? No, no, no. I'm starting to get the feeling there's a little bit of OCD creeping into the business here. 
We're a tidy outfit, you know, so I can say, Pete and uh, Pete, this is Mark. Fortunately, it wasn't just me willing to give the boss a hard time. This is probably the cleanest garage operation I've ever seen. Yeah, well, this is still ongoing as well. We haven't finished yet. We're bringing it up to standard, his standard in between doing the vans. And what do people say behind the scenes? Behind the scenes? Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard people call him nutty, but how can you call a man nutty when he's... He's gone to such a high level and built a business yeah. out of nothing. Would you want a dirty plumber in your house? Well, you wouldn't, would you? Of course not. There you go. We have standards, you know what I mean? And it's either, you know, airway or highway. Charlie's personality is stamped all over his business and its staff. He's controlling, organised and obsessed with image. But his strategy is clearly working. And as well as eliminating the muck, he's clearly making a lot of brass. People have asked me, did you expect to get where you are today as a plumber? The answer is no, but it can be done. Charlie draws a million pound annual salary from his company. He's got homes in Kent and Marbella, where he's also expanding the business for the expat community. This is a water feature we had done, um, you know, our fellas here, the, the English fellas done all this, you know. All the pump, it's all in there and all the plumbing. I know you think that's boring, but it's not. I don't know that the word proud comes into it, you know what I mean? I just think that, um, you know, you go work, work hard, and the end result is you earn a few quid. It's all about believing in your own products and making it work. And I'm telling you that if you put hard work into anything, you'll be successful. Before I dig deeper into Charlie's roots and the reasons for his success, I've got an appointment with an entrepreneur whose background could hardly be more different. But like Charlie, Lord Billamoria of Chelsea has also faced some difficult business decisions. Success is not a destination, success is a journey. And it's a journey with lots of ups and downs. And as long as the trajectory is an upward trajectory, you will still have those bumps. Karen Billamoria started a beer company that today turns over 50 million pounds a year. But it's not all been plain sailing. And my mission is to find out how he's adapted in difficult times. To get a taste of Karen's product, I've travelled up the M1 to the UK's biggest brewery in Burton-on-Trent. Lord Bill Hello, Nice Peter. to see you. Very good to see you. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. Well, this is a huge complex, isn't it? It is. It's uh, welcome to the Burton Brewery, the biggest brewery in Britain and one of the biggest in Europe. And this is where Cobra beer is brewed. It's been brewed here for the last three years, along with being brewed in Belgium oh. and in India. An Indian beer in Britain. Sounds interesting. Should we go through and have a check? Beer in Britain is big business. This massive plant alone can produce over 150 million cases a year, contributing to a market with an annual retail value of 16 and a half billion pounds. So this is the actual production line now coming this off. Is the production oh, that's line. all Cobra. All Cobra. What does that make you feel like when you see that? Oh, I love it. I love the sound of the clinking bottles. Karen seems very at home in his overalls, as he proudly shows me round the factory that now produces the beer he invented 20 years ago. Born in India in 1961, Karen's father and grandfather were both officers in the Indian Army. Luck is when determination meets opportunity. He's public school educated, a Cambridge graduate and a fully qualified accountant. I would say that I'm an entrepreneur and I would like to think that I'm an entrepreneur with a conscience and trying to practice business with the right principles. I wanted to make not just a beer that was different but I wanted to be the best Indian beer ever. It was at university that the idea for a new beer was born. The beer idea really started from the time I came as a student when I took an instant liking to real ale. And then I found very quickly that ale was delicious on its own in a pub, but hopeless with food because it was too heavy and too bitter. And I found fizzy lagers were just terrible to drink on their own and particularly bad to drink with food. And that's when this idea evolved that I would produce a beer one day, which I would make in India, that would have refreshing qualities of lager and the smoothness of an ale combined. Whatever business you're going to go into, it's going to be against all the odds. 
it's the way you practice business that is important. And one of my favorite sayings is it's not just good enough to be the best in the world, but the best for the world. I think most of us would claim to have good principles in business, but the profit must be good too, or there's simply nothing to give back. During my time with Karen, I'll be finding out why he's so keen to balance good ethics with good economics, and how for him that comes with a 70 million pound price tag. This is a call centre, Pete. Right, OK. Um, looks busy. Thank God it is. Back in Pimlico, I wanted to get under the skin of who Charlie really was. And who better to ask than the call centre manager, who also happens to be his wife for 41 years. Peter, this is my wife, Linda. This Hello. Is Peter. Nice to meet you. What is he really like, not to live with? He is a workaholic, and if we're not working at home, we're working here, so we're working all the time. <laughs> well, you know, we've got family, there's... You know, we've got you know, loads that. of family, we've got eight grandkids. And, you uh, don't find a lot of time with the younger ones, do you? Because you're too busy all the time. But the older ones, because they can work as well, like, then he's fine with them. But the younger ones, the baby, we've got a five-month-old one. You don't spend so much time with her, no, do you? She can't pick the phones up or wash fans, <laughs> can she? <laughs> <laughs> That's well, what I mean. No, yeah. but you know what I'm saying, but... It's what I deal with all the time. But it's not just his wife that Charlie employs. He's got two daughters and two sons, all on the payroll. And even the grandchildren chip in. Hi, guys. These are my two grandsons, Pete. Hello. Your two grandsons? Yeah. What's Ashley. That? Ashley. Charlie. Charlie Junior. Yeah. So you're yeah. both going to be plumbers? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to be, yeah. Are you going to run Pimlico pl Plumbers one day? Hopefully. Yeah. And one day you'll be driving yeah, one of these? Yeah, okay. it's got my name on the back. <laughs> Working with family is not easy, but I was starting to wonder if Charlie was using his family to reinforce the hold he has over his company. Combined with his extremely polished corporate image, I was beginning to sense he was uneasy, desperate not to lose control. Rooting out the reason for this would take more time, but I was determined to get there soon. God, this is huge, isn't and it? There, you see you've got new bottles. With over 3,000 beers on the UK market, a new brand, like Karen created, had to have a great USP in order to succeed. Wow, got one. God, I've, I've, I feel like a naughty boy. I've just come into the back of a builder's yard and pinched <laughs> something. Now, these icons, each one of these stands for a stage in the Cobra beer story. And you see, these are my father's crest. So I was introduced to beer in the Indian Army messes. The elephants stand for learning. I came up with the idea of Cobra when I was a student at Cambridge. This is um, a, a snake charmer in a rice field with the word beer. So it, was, it, it involved rice is in the recipe okay. and it came out of nowhere. It didn't exist before. And the scales? These scales tipped one way, which showed it was against all the odds. And then down here you have a palm tree and a building with a bee on it. Is the palm tree, was that supposed and to be? Bangalore, where, where my first brewed Cobra was in Bangalore. I then also started brewing it in Bedford and now I brew it in Burton. Well, that's quite amazing. Is that the finished product? This is it. Labeling? This is chilled, fresh beer, unpasteurized. You can feel how cold it is. And this is before it goes into pasteurizing. It's only relatively recently that Karen's brand has become a household name in the UK. So this emphasis on a rather slender history and heritage is actually a clever marketing device in a fiercely competitive industry. Good PR and marketing is something that seems to come quite naturally to Charlie Mullins. He courts celebrity clients. And you a lot of people describe your looks and, I, and say, what does Charlie Mullins look like? I say he looks like the last balloon at a children's party. <laughs> you know that? <laughs> and he's even hired a publicist to help manage media opportunities and promote the business in the press. Peter, this is a reception area. <laughs> What's this, Charlie? Well, a lot of these are, wow. are customers we work for, celebrities and um, high-profile people. So when you walk in here, what, imagine I'm a customer now. OK. What impression are you trying to give me? The idea is to give a general feel of the company. And if somebody's not, not aware of us, this hopefully backs up the type of outfit we are. Who's that old guy there, then? That's Buster. You'll never believe how old Buster is. Who's Buster? Buster was uh, 
one of the oldest workers in Britain, uh, and he joined us when he was 97, Buster. 97? 97, yeah. We got him out of the old people's home down the end there. <laughs> no, he's not you didn't. Well, to be honest, he'd walk up here and have a fag and I'd give him a fiver or something, go and have a beer or something. And then he said, rather than give me, give me money, give me a job. So, what can you do, Buster? And he said, uh, you know, I'll wash the vans, I'll do anything. So, we took him on at 97. And uh, seven years he was with us. That's a shame he's not around no more, but... And why did you do that? Was that a bit of a, a publicity tactic? Not at all. It, it wasn't about a publicity thing. I mean, you know, he'd come here, used to do his work, and uh, for us it was value for money, you know what I mean? OK. Do I look that I'm that, that such a nice, kind fella to be doing it? There's always... I think there's method in your madness. Method in your madness, you're right. So, recruiting a hundred-year-old plumber and getting acres of press coverage as a result wasn't a publicity stunt. I'm not quite sure I buy that. Time to get past the bluff and find out what's really behind this polished PR-loving plumber. Charlie founded his business with a second-hand van and a bag of tools in 1979. Three years later, he had a team of five working for him, and by 1988, he was closing in on the magic million pound turnover mark. But then, recession struck. The premises he'd borrowed heavily to buy lost over three quarters of its value, and Charlie fell into serious amounts of debt. Pimlico had sprung a leak. As a company then, we nearly went bust, you know. We never had it right at all. We was employing the wrong people, we was offering the wrong service. Just was a million miles away from it. And nearly went under then, went and see two liquidators then, you know, to, wow. to actually, that's how serious it was. One liquidator said, turn it all in. And we went and got a second opinion, which was a great idea. And he said, well, you're going to lose your ass, you're going to lose everything anyhow. You might as well fight for it. And that's what we've done. So from that moment, I sort of changed everything. I changed the staff. Every member of staff went that was with us then. I think it was such a frightening time. We never had any sort of do's and don'ts. We never had no rules or guidelines to go by. Once that went, we, I formed the Pimlico Bible, we call it now, and it's everything we do here, we operate, is in the book. A plumber's with a Bible? This is something I had to see. What do you reckon? It's a Bible, isn't it? <laughs> Pimlico Bible. All your working guidelines. There you go, personal appearance. <laughs> it says anything other than the company issued items of visible clothing, so that's clear, you've got your uniform. Extreme hairstyles, no ponytails. Mm. You can't have stubble or be unshaven. Earrings other than female operatives. All I'm saying is that as Pimlico plumbers, you know, you're representing us, you're going in somebody's house, and we want you to look presentable. So what happens if an employee doesn't adhere to something in this Bible? They go. Really? Yeah. OK, because that's, that's really, really interesting for me, because that now makes sense. Because you've put controls in place in your business when your business was out of control. And now, because you see that you've got organised and you've put all these clear, very black and white restrictions on your staff and what you expect, you've got success from that, haven't you? Yeah, I'll agree with that, yeah. Back in Burton-on-Trent, it was almost time to share a glass of beer. Oh, it's cold. That's for you. So if you're tasting beer, you first tilt thing... the glass. No, don't tilt the glass. What? You have to keep it absolutely upright, and then pour it very slowly, straight up. You can see the head of the beer. Next thing is, what you want to do is test the clarity of the beer. So you put your finger at the top there. You want to look through to see your finger behind. Next thing... Remember, we haven't sipped it yet. Next thing you're seeing the colour. Is the beer looking quite, quite nice and golden coloured? Now, one more thing before you taste it. The aroma. All right, now you can taste it. Cheers. Here Cheers. Right. So I'd learnt something new about pouring beer, but I was supposed to be finding out about Karen's entrepreneurial journey. If I take you back to when you first came up with the whole Cobra concept, tell me a little bit about that. I did a law degree at Cambridge. I loved my time at Cambridge, but I had realised very quickly I was not going to practice as a lawyer. 
what I really wanted to do was start my own business. And within six months of um, finishing my studies, I set up my business. And my business, I had one big idea. The big idea was this beer idea of mine. Right. But I started with 20,000 pounds of student debt to pay off. And so I started with a business partner of mine, a childhood friend of mine from India. And we started importing polo sticks because I used to play polo for Cambridge. Okay. And I captained the first ever tour of India for the Cambridge University polo team. I brought back some sticks with me and I started selling them to Lily Whites and to Harrods and to the Royal Family Saddlers. All this was getting us experience in sourcing products, in importing, in raising finance, the basics of business. And all the time, the beer idea was there. We're still there. In 1990, Karen and his beer got their first big break when a large brewery in India agreed to produce his new recipe for export. Timing is so critical when bringing any product to market, and Karen got his right, because as his beer was being launched in the UK, the nation's tastes were changing. The number of new Indian restaurants was on the rise, and lager was beginning to outsell ale. Within five years, the company was valued at one and a half million pounds. Today, it turns over more than 30 times that, but I know that startups rarely come without difficulties. I needed to know exactly what economic and emotional challenges he faced in the early days of the business. Having secured support from the brewery in India, Karen started to distribute his beer from a small flat he and his business partner shared in West London. So this is it, this is where it all started. This is it, yes, on the second and third floor up there. The beer would get delivered by lorry and drop a pallet of beer here. And a pallet of beer weighs one ton, literally one ton, 72 cases of so beer. So literally on the pavement was your deliveries yeah. of all your Cobra beer? All the Cobra. And then my partner and I would go up all those flights of stairs. So how did you go about delivering it? Well, our company car was this 295 pound bright green battered Citroen de Chevaux called Albert. And it needed push starting oh. most days. And you could see the road through the holes in the floor of the car and it could carry exactly 15 cases of Cobra if you put some on the front seat as well. And what about money then? So clearly, you were literally brassic. You had no money at all. We would run out of money all the time. I remember once up in that roof conversion, sitting there, and I looked at my wallet. I pulled my wallet out, literally pulled my wallet out, and there was no money. I looked in there, there were pennies. I mean, do you feel like giving up? Do you feel down in the dumps? You feel really down in the dumps. Yeah. So that was really, it was, everything was teetering on a knife edge. Yes. Raising money was impossible. We had a recession on in those days, like we do now. It's horrible having to ask people, you know, to give you more credit, to go to your bank manager. Is that what you did? And there was a bank manager around the corner here, and he used to, our overdraft limit was 11,000 pounds. He let it go to 26,000 pounds. He said, do you know if you let me down, I'm coming to the end of my career, I'm about to get my pension, I will lose everything if you boys let me down. And of course, we never let him down. You've got to really believe in your idea and in your product and in your brand. And I knew from the beginning, when we got those first reorders, we had something that was going to succeed and something that could become a global brand. That's what gets you through it. Taking on so much debt at such an early stage of the business shows that Karen believed in himself and his product. It also hints at an attitude to borrowing and risk that would get him into hot water later. So far, I'd enjoyed Karen's company. His charm and charisma are qualities that serve him and his company well. But I was troubled by the fact that Karen's beer is brewed in Britain. Whenever I drank it in the past, I'd bought into the idea that it was an authentic Indian beer imported into the UK. To discover it was in fact made in Burton-on-Trent was actually a little disappointing, but something I was determined to investigate. Later, I would discover something in Karen's business history that would test the mettle of even the most resilient entrepreneur. Like Karen, Charlie's entrepreneurial instincts have been severely tested. His brush with bankruptcy means that he now keeps his family close and rules his business with an iron fist. The image of his company and its employees is of paramount importance to him. To strip away Charlie's PR veneer, I'd have to take him out of his comfort zone and away from his businesses. 
I wanted to dig deeper into Charlie's background and discover where and how he was first inspired to become a plumber and a businessman. Ready now to uh, Elephant and Castle. Rockingham Estate is, uh, you know, where I was brought up on, council estate there. Pretty rough estate, you know. I ain't looking forward to going back there, if I'm being honest. Makes me nervous. You're not? Nah, nah, makes me nervous. Um, you know, but my time living there weren't good, you know what I mean? I didn't like it at all. Charlie was one of four boys. His dad worked in a factory and his mum was a cleaner. Mm. Is it safe? <laughs> oh. This is it? Yeah, unfortunately. I used to live right out the uh, top floor, you know what I mean? Right on the very top, number 53. No lift, no lights. Uh, they used to have all like bars up at the windows, you know what I mean? Uh, You've still got quite a lot of bars up, haven't you? Yeah, I, don't, I wasn't sure if that was to stop people getting in or to stop you getting out. Was it that bad? <laughs> well, what do you think, you know what I mean? So how did you then get yourself out of here? Fortunately, there was a, a local plumber, a chap called Bill Ellis, and I sort of met him and he explained to me about plumbing, and he had a, a nice house, he had a motorbike, he had a car, he had loads of money, and he said to me, if you're going to plumbing, uh, you, you'll have a job for life, and um, you'll earn lots of money, you know? And uh, fortunately, he was right, you know what I mean? So would you say you've been here, you've moved on, but you don't want to ever come back? Um, you're right. And I agree with all of them. I may have discovered Charlie's first entrepreneurial role model, but 50 years ago, it wasn't plumbing that inspired him to succeed. This is going to bring back some memories here, you know. This was my life, boxing, you know. So this is your boxing club? Yeah, yeah. Started at 15. Lynn Boxing Club is one of the oldest in the country. It's trained Olympic hopefuls and professional fighters. Probably get over the whole lot. Oh, he gets over the top. I struggle well under the bottom. The club played such an important part in Charlie's history that he has donated thousands of pounds to keep it running. So when was the last time a glove went on? I think I was about 21, you know what I mean? I started 15, stopped at 21 through head injury. I got sort of knocked out against London versus Wales and um, unfortunately I whacked my head on, you know, on this bit out here. Ooh. Somehow went under the rope back there and uh, wound up in hospital for a week. But, you know, the good thing that come out of it, I suppose, is, um, you know, I then really concentrated on work. You know, I'd probably become a workaholic because of the, uh, you know, not being able to box. Tell me when you're ready. I'm ready, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can feel that. How does it feel, putting the gloves back on? Well, that's feel good, actually. Does it? Yeah, I could make a comeback. You put a nice little dent in there. But you know what, it's interesting. You can see it in your eyes. You, it's a bit of a passion, you still love it. Oh, I love it. Never been near boxing for about 30 years because uh, I think it hurts so much not to be able to do something you love, you know? And you always think, you know, how far, how far would have you gone in boxing? And how uh, far do you think you would have gone? Uh, I'd have won a lot more than what I'd have lost, that's for sure, you know what I mean? And look where, look where, where you ended up. You could be what now? A Contender. You could be a contender. <laughs> could have been a contender. Um, now, if I'm being honest, give me a choice, boxer or a plumber, I'd be a boxer. Really? Yeah. This was my passion, this was my love. And, um, you know what I mean? I think it was cruelly taken away from me, if I'm being honest, you know what I mean? Finally, Charlie's starting to let his guard down and slowly revealing who he really is. Charlie's head injury was a turning point in his life. But from an early age, he'd shown he was a fighter, not afraid of hard work and hugely aspirational. Key traits of every successful entrepreneur I know. For my next meeting with Karen Billamoria, I wanted to go back to the place where his business really got started. It was here, on Brick Lane, that the fledgling entrepreneur sold his first bottle. Very few Indian restaurant owners drink alcohol, so convincing them to sell a new type of beer posed a unique business challenge. I was keen to meet one of the company's first sales reps, Samsung Sahel. 
Martin Heron. Ah, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome to Brick Lane. Hi, Thank this you. Is Samson. Samson, it's a great pleasure to meet Peter. you. Peter, same here. Samson has been with me since 1993. 19 years. Wow. It's <laughs> 19 years. Wow. So, will you give me a tour of Brick Lane then? I will do, Peter. Thank Let's you. Go. Let's go. So, Karen told me that employing Samson was a masterstroke. This is off Hi. Top. Off top, I'm Peter. Hello. Yeah. Hi, good to meet you. He was so desperate to prove himself that he initially offered to work just on commission only. What was it that Samson gave you that you thought, I'm going to go for it? He's a good persuader. <laughs> so, it was him? It was him. We only sell Cobra beer. Yes. You only sell only Cobra? The, that's the only beer we sell. And what about this man? What do you think of him? He's very nice. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> Hi. Good to see you. How are you? Hi. Samson apparently smashed all the sales targets he was set and two decades on is a millionaire and a shareholder in his own right. What was it that persuaded you to buy the beer? It was a new idea. That was something uh, you always want to know. That, you know. If customers are happy, we are happy to sell the product which customers are willing to go for. And the fact that it was an Indian beer, did that make a difference to you? That of course. Yes, yeah, it was Indian beer, plus it was better than other beer that they told me. Customers. But I still had some issues to tackle with Karen. I wanted to explore his entrepreneurial ethos and whether he feels he used his ethnicity and cultural connections to get the beer onto the market. Wasn't there just a little bit thinking, this is an Indian beer for an Indian community, please help me, please endorse it, please support an, another fellow Indian rather than buy my product because it's great? The most important thing was the product. It all came down to the product being genuinely different, genuinely better, authentic, and doing, doing a fantastic job in terms of customers loving it. But if you're selling something that doesn't deliver what you're saying, you're a con man. You sold your product into a community. I think one of the USPs is the fact that it's an Indian beer. Yes, very much so. But it's very, very clear to me now that actually it's an Indian beer made in Burton-on-Trent. I came up with the idea for Cobra as an Indian in Britain. I created it in India with Indians. And for the first seven years, we exported Cobra from India. The fact that the Cobra we consume here has not been produced in India and shipped over from India does not stop it from being an Indian beer. This is a beer of Indian origin. Is the fact that you're eating this food over here not Indian because it hasn't been cooked in Delhi and flown over from there. Is that not really calling the public? No one is ever trying to con anyone. One's got to be absolutely... Integrity is a key word. And very clear it says where it's brewed on the bottle. It is a, an Indian beer, a beer of Indian origin, created in India. It is an Indian product, which is essential when you're selling beer. Um, it was a bit of a political answer from Lord Billamoria. Clearly, an inspired mix of clever marketing and dogged determination got his beer off the ground. But I know that his journey from Brick Lane to multi-millionaire businessman was not easy. I was about to unravel the secrets of Karen's business past and discuss a make-or-break deal that tested everything he believed in. Back at the boxing club, Charlie had already revealed how he'd been forced to make a life-changing decision. Let's go and have a rest. A well-earned rest. I think I would have got you in the last round, though. I think you got me in the first. What I now needed to know was when and where Charlie first recognised his instinct for making money. And whether he still has the drive and determination to take his business to the next level. <laughs> Whilst you're in that Rockingham estate, did you realise at that time that you we're going to become an entrepreneur. I always knew I was going to make a few quid, you know what I mean? Whether it be a bit of ducking and diving or a bit of work and a bit of this, but um, I, I mean, I'm not sure about the word entrepreneur or I've never heard of it before, you know what I mean? Certainly on the rock in them, I don't think it was out there then, but um, yeah, I, I suppose being honest, I knew I would always get a pound note. What was your average day as a, as a teenager? I don't know, we'd just go to the youth club, Go boxing. I mean, boxing was the thing that um, you know really got you away from it. You know what I mean? That 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 was wonderful. It makes you stand up for yourself. It makes you want to achieve things. 
Um, where I am today, I actually think it's a lot to do with the boxing. You know, where I missed out on the boxing, I just become total workaholic. You know, and um, I thought there ain't no one going to like knock me away on this. You know what I mean? That's for sure. So you've come from nothing, and now look at what's happened to your life. That's inspiring, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it is inspiring. You know, I'm a normal fella. You know what I mean? I sort of, you know, come from South London. You know, I'm a plumber. I can't be making out I'm someone I'm Come not. Come on, Charlie, you're, you're about as normal as a dodo, aren't you? I'm, I'm a plumber. Yeah, but you're, a, you're not a normal plumber. No, I'm an expensive plumber. There's, there's things inside you that are very different to the average person on the street. You know, the average person on the street isn't, you know, a complete control freak. The average person on the street isn't as determined and passionate about starting their own business. You are anything but average. Oh, well, I don't know. If, for me, I'm just a normal person. I mean, I, you know, as I said to you, I haven't changed much. You know, what I mean, I don't speak any better than what I used to speak. And now, what's it, what's what's important to to Charlie now? What's the next few years hold? Get a bit more of the plumbing share in London, a bit more of the market share in London. Where Charlie came from is clear, but it's not as clear to see where he's going. I have to say. I was just a little bit disappointed by his lack of ambition because most of the entrepreneurs I know have plans for their business to take over the world. It's something I want to tackle with him before our time together is up. While Charlie was fighting his way out of poverty in South London, Karen Billamoria was enjoying the high life at public school in India. On the face of it, his career has followed a privileged path from private education to Cambridge and now Parliament. But Karen could rightly say there's a difference between being presented with opportunity and actually making the most of it. My task is to find out who inspired him and what drove him on when making those crucial first steps into business. Hi Peter. Karen, how are you? Oh, well, thanks, how are you? Nice to see you. you. Welcome to Parliament. Well, thank you. Yeah, here we are in the central lobby in the Palace of Westminster. Beautiful. And this is the centre of it. If you stand on that spot, you're right in the middle of Parliament. So this is the middle of Parliament? This is it. You're this is the centre of the universe? Centre of the world. Karen Billamoria was made Lord Billamoria of Chelsea in 2006. He's a crossbench peer and one of the youngest to sit in the House of Lords. Every time I, I walk in, in here, I feel privileged to be here and I feel lucky and I just pinch myself often and say, is this real? This is so beautiful. This is so fantastic. So you, you seem to me coming across, you love heritage. You love history. It's important to you. History is, is so crucial because you've got to learn from your past. My family uh, on my father's side are a military family and on my mother's side uh, is, is more of a business family, although my, my grandfather served in the Royal Indian Air Force. He was from a business family, and my great-grandfather was a member of the upper house in India, the Rajya Sabha, the equivalent of the House of Lords, wow. Didi Italia, and he was an entrepreneur, he was a philanthropist, he was somebody who looked after his family really well, and he's been a great inspiration to me. Walking through Parliament with Lord Billamoria may have been an honour. Where are we? Here we are. Are oh, you here? Yeah but getting into his slightly less impressive car didn't fill me with quite the same emotion. I've had this car for 16 years. Yeah. I've driven each of our four children home from the hospitals when they've been born. In this car? In this car and taken them home. Because I must and say, when I, I came out and, yeah. and saw this, I wasn't quite expecting a, a car like this. I mean, it's, it, will, it will get us where we're going, will it? <laughs> It's very clearly a, a, quite a privileged background that you've had. Have you used any family contacts that have helped you in business in any way? Yes, the family connections have always been there. For example, it's how I knew my business partner, Arjun Reddy, because our families had known each other for four generations. It was Arjun Reddy's uncle, Keshav Reddy, who was our mentor here in London. He was the one who introduced us to our first bank manager who gave us a £7,000 wow. overdraft. And in those days, to get an unsecured £7,000 overdraft was a big deal. And it was through Uncle Keshav that we got the intro introduction to Mysore Breweries, who we created Cobra with. Do you think that you would still be able to have 
achieved what you've achieved without that family background? At that time, 30 years ago, there's no question that this country, Britain, had a glass ceiling. I was told by my family and friends very clearly, if you decide to work in Britain after your studies, remember you'll never get to the top because you'll never be allowed to get to the top as a foreigner, there will be a glass ceiling, and there was a glass ceiling. And what has changed um, has been over these last three decades is that that glass ceiling has been well and truly shattered. I really believe this is a country now where there is opportunity for all, regardless of race, religion, or background and anyone can get anywhere depending on their abilities and their aspiration. It was fascinating to hear Karen reflect on the cultural challenges he faced. But all entrepreneurs face obstacles, and I can't help feeling his family connections were crucial to his early success. Where earlier I'd discovered the roots of Charlie's fighting spirit, lay in a boxing gym in Camberwell, Karen's was to be found in the slightly more auspicious Constitution Hill. So, here we are at the Memorial Gates. Beautiful sandstone columns with the names of the countries whose citizens served in the First and Second World War. And we're talking about nearly five million individuals. And it's absolutely remarkable. I can read some of the things Predominantly here. from India. Of course, India alone in the Indian subcontinent, two and a half million, including 132,000 Gurkhas. My father was head of all the Gurkhas in India before he retired. And do you think, you, when you look up there, your dad is looking down on you, thinking how proud he is of what you've I, achieved? I, I think of him all the time when I'm here. Yes, so we had the three Victoria Cross winners, Netra Bahadur Thapa, who was posthumous, and Gajay Gale and Agan Singh Rai, both of whom I was brought up with from childhood. And if you hear of Gajay Gale, who was wounded in the attack that he was involved in, but continued to lead his men, refused to go for medical help until he had won that battle. And only when he was forced to, completely wounded, but still fighting, was he taken away. With Agan Singh Rai, inspiring his men leading from the front, defeating the Japanese, and then going single-handedly to a bunker and overpowering a whole group of Japanese on his own. Bravery that is unbelievable, inspirational beyond belief. Has this motivated you personally to succeed with your own life and mission? Well, often when I think of any problems or challenges I might be going through in business, in life, it is nothing compared with what these individuals faced in battle. And my father faced going to war. Nothing. It just puts everything into context. For the first time, I felt I'd broken through Karen's political persona and witnessed some real emotion. I'd discovered that for completely different reasons, both he and Charlie Mullins' pasts have motivated and inspired them in their business battles. The time had come for my final meeting with Charlie at his home in Kent. I was still curious about what I saw as a lack of ambition. Estimates suggest his plumbing business owns 6% of the market in London and Charlie is developing his interests in Spain. But if I were him, I'd be pushing the company even further by rolling it out across the country or even developing my own branded products. Hello, Charlie. Peter. I've got my kit for a game of tennis. Good man. You all right? I'm ready. I'm I was ready. eager to tackle these tough issues with Charlie, but I hadn't forgotten the beating he gave me in the boxing ring. And it was time to get my own back. Oh, lovely pool. I like this. That's me phone. Oh. Just upgraded it. <laughs> and this bit you'll like, I'll show you this bit here. Now, follow follow me. <laughs> you'll like this bit. Now, Pimlico Bible. Give me a break. I'll tell you. You put Pimlico Bible on the mur mural yeah. in your pool. You have to risk your life to see it. Right, I'm going to get there, change your room there, mate. I'm going to get changed. Go and pre prepare yourself for defeat. <laughs> Do you want a game or a lesson? No, give me a game. Let's go for All it. All right, mate. 
Charlie's backyard seemed a long way from the tennis academy that was my first entrepreneurial enterprise. Come on, Charlie, get on with it. But both Charlie and I were finding it hard to conceal our competitive spirit. Oh, yes! What can I say? That was some sort of Pete. Charlie, well done, thank you. Should we go and get dry and have a chat? Yeah, you bet. We'll start talking to me about tennis, and you ever play tennis? <laughs> As each day has gone on, and I've got to know you, I'm not going to say that I completely understand how you are and how you operate, but I've come to really like you. I think you're really, really <laughs> clever. You're fairly calculating, you're fairly manipulative, you know what you're doing. But one thing that I really have struggled with is you don't want to expand this amazing business that you've created. If I was 10 times bigger, How's it going to change my lifestyle? It would probably change it for the worse, you know what I mean? I mean, uh... I'm sitting here thinking, I'll tell you what I would do. I'd definitely go up and down the country. I'd open up a depot in Manchester. I might even think about a range of different products. You've opened up in Spain, but I think that's more to do with the fact that you're there in Spain and you like it because you feel comfortable. I'm more than happy to work on getting a bit more of the market uh, share in London, and I think we're heading towards that anyhow, you know, and the difference is I'm not going to bust the guts to do it. Do you think something psychologically is... It could well be, yeah, yeah. ...preventing you from growing your business? Um, it's not fear, that's for sure. And, um, you know, I don't have the, the, the want or need for, you know, a few more quids handy, but, you know, that ain't what sort of makes me work these days. Um, look, I think I've got, I've got a nice business, a nice, nice family, nice lifestyle. What more do I need? So you're happy with your lot? Yeah, of course I am. Just got to let me face now. <laughs> I think that sort of sums you up. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't want to be the richest man in the graveyard. And I think I might have taken a little bit away from that as well, because I know what I'm like. I'm running at 400 miles an hour, trying to do so many different things, and it's certainly spending time with you has made me realise that Maybe it's time that I should take it a little bit easy. Yeah, well, you know, Pete, a day without learning is a day wasted. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And Charlie, I've got to ask you this. Plastic surgery or no plastic surgery? You can be honest with me. Oh. Uh -huh. A little bit? If this had cost me money, I'd want my money back, Pete. <laughs> That's what I love about you. You're very, very good. <laughs> Success in big business is rarely achieved without conquering some serious obstacles. And I wanted to dig deeper into Karen's story. Before our final meeting, I discovered that his business had experienced turbulent times that seriously tested both Karen's personal and business ethics. It was time to find out how he coped when the chips were down. Identifying allies in the battlefield of business is a key part of almost every successful entrepreneur's skill set, and Karen is no exception. Oh. Iqbal. Hi, Karen. How are you doing? Peter Jones. Peter Jones. Nice to meet you. Great to meet you. Iqbal Wahab was a journalist and PR expert who played a massive part in marketing Karen's beer in its early days. And you've known each other for a long time. I had a PR company in the late 80s, early 90s. Karen and I also had a business together in the mid-90s. Yeah, which was a, a magazine That's directed right. directly at the, at the Indian, Indian restaurant, restaurant, restaurant business. And it's still going. Very clever. Tandoori magazine was founded in 1994. On one level, it was a vehicle through which the Asian catering industry could communicate. Thank you very much. Thanks, Iqbal. But it was also a genius idea that gave Karen a free platform from which to promote his beer. Great location. When we were building Cobra, we had no money to market. How do you reach out to 6,500 restaurants? We looked out for a trade magazine that went out to the Indian restaurants, and there wasn't one, so we started one. OK, so it wasn't really the opportunity in terms of the fact that you thought there was a real business in the magazine world. You thought that as a result of introducing a magazine, your Cobra brand would benefit. I wanted it to be an objective magazine where Cobra could advertise, of course, would advertise regularly, and, and we were 
I mean, I was financing the whole thing, but it had to be objective. And, and that's why the magazine became the trade magazine for the sector from the time it started. Owning both the magazine and a beer brand meant Karen was walking a fine line between editorial interest and economic gain. A risk that backfired with disastrous consequences when the magazine featured an article criticising the service in Indian restaurants by claiming all waiters were miserable. There was an article written in the late 90s which upset the restaurants because of the way it was written and it was quite critical. And as a result of that, there was a boycott of Cobra beer. What, um, the Indian restaurants just boycotted it? Boycotted Cobra beer. Wow. Um, okay, so that's a that real... That was, it was a terrible that experience that we went on and it took a year um, for the boycott to be lifted. And it is the most really? awful experience you can ever go through as a business, where business was booming. We were growing at almost 70% year on year. We'd opened up depots all around the country, and suddenly, you just, everything just stops. And then, horrendous. the way we won through in the end was by literally communicating with the restaurants and explaining that we would never ever wish to harm them, our own customers. And we'd, it would mean sometimes being called to visit a restaurant in the West Country at 10 o'clock at night, getting there, driving straight down, seeing them at 1 in the, in the morning, being with them to 2 or 3 in the morning, and driving back, coming back to London at 6 in the morning. And a year later, the boycott was over and we've never looked back. Having put his business in jeopardy once, Karen managed to win his customers back through sheer hard work and determination. Then growth of over 50% between 2000 and 2006 attracted some serious investors and together they adopted an aggressive, debt-funded expansion plan. But in 2008, Karen looked like he was about to lose it all again. The global recession meant those investors wanted their money back. He was forced to put his business up for sale. You're in sinking sand as a business then. You've expanded at a rapid rate. Yep. We had a lot of debt. And now you're in a situation where that debt can't even be refinanced. And now you're going to a point where you are about to lose everything you've worked for your entire life. Yeah. Tell me how you felt at that point. You feel absolutely terrible. You, know, you feel absolutely awful, but you realize that you have to survive. You have to get through it. And then you've got to have that faith and that resolve within yourself that you're going to get through it and did be it, determined. Did it not put a strain on your, your, your family relationship, on your marriage? Or? Of course it does, of course. It, it affects every part of your life. Did, was there a point where you ever felt this, this is too much? Several times you feel it's too much, but you never think of giving up, never ever. And no tears? I can't remember crying. But I could have easily cried if I, if, you know, it, it, it was almost beyond tears. It was so bad. It was terrible. Really? Throughout all that, I said to myself, one thing you're going to do is behave with dignity through this process. And, and seeing everyone else around me um, losing it, behaving awfully. Karen needed to find a solution, one that he hoped fitted with his values. It came in the form of American brewer's Molson Coors. They formed a joint venture with Cobra and brought it back from the brink by selling the company's assets through a controversial pre-packaged administration. Pre-packed administrations have a very bad reputation because, sadly, they are misused and that bad reputation is justified. With a pre-pack, you're trying to save as much as possible. That's the whole idea of a pre-pack. But unfortunately, pre-packs are often conducted in a manner where they happen very quickly and the next day the same business starts the same premises, the same people in the same way, having wiped out all their shareholders, having wiped out all their unsecured creditors, having wiped out all their employees, and they start again. Uh, and there is no way I could have done that. I said, I'm not going to take advantage of this mechanism. A, I'm going to look after all my employees. B, all my shareholders I'm going to take along with me. Next, secure creditors will all be looked after. And the next thing I said is, I will also make sure that all the unsecured creditors are settled however long it takes me. And, and how I, are you going to do that? Because the I am doing it as we speak. And the amount is, it's a huge amount of money, isn't it? Yes. Reportedly 70 million. It's a, it's a huge amount of money. And you're still going to repay every penny? That is what I'm going to do. I'm going to settle the whole lot. 
For Karen, opting for a prepack was apparently the best option in the circumstances. Sadly, many people lose money when a business goes into administration, but Karen believes he's different because of that promise to pay back everyone that lost their money. It's almost like your military sort of heritage came into play in that business environment. It's a bit like having your wounded infantry that have come back from the war under your leadership. Now you're looking after their families. We could make that analogy. I just feel you can't let people down. You can't, you know, people have had the faith to back you in whatever way, whether it's as a supplier, whether it's as an investor, you can't let people down. I can see Karen's determined to keep the promises he's made to his old creditors, but he faces a real uphill battle because he doesn't own all the company and 70 million pounds is a huge amount of money to try and pay back. However admirable, I'm not convinced it's achievable. Charlie Mullins and Karen Billamoria are intriguing individuals from totally different backgrounds. While they may have completely contrasting cultural roots, they've both made their dreams of success a reality. And now I know how they did it. Both Charlie and Karen are acutely aware of the importance of image and work hard to push the profile of their brand. Yet there is substance to much of their spin. Is it safe? <laughs> Charlie came from humble origins but was determined to better himself and he has made millions by working hard. You know, I believe that the, the, the more you put into something, the more you get out of it. So I'm a great believer that, you know, by giving something your full whack, you can get an end result. I think it's just believing that you can succeed in life. But Charlie's also work smart, learning from his mistakes and changing his ways when disaster loomed. I'm really pleased and I do value things and, you know, I value the fact that, you know, all your family can enjoy them things. Also faced with downfall, Karen made some tough business decisions. Success is not a destination, success is a journey. And there's no question about it, the real test of leadership is leadership in adversity, leadership in crises, is how do you come through the tough times? Karen's kept his company alive without losing sight of the most important thing to him, his principles. Our vision is to aspire and achieve against all odds with integrity. And that's what I think entrepreneurship is all about, is coming up with an idea, wanting to get somewhere with the idea, having all the odds stacked against you, having little or no means, and going out there and making it happen. It's this do or die, adapt and survive attitude that has made these inspiring entrepreneurs who they are today. Next time... Hello, Peter. Oh, hi. Good, Good to, to meet, meet you. you. I'll be meeting Laura Tennyson, whose brush with death changed her life. I had this terrible head-on collision. I broke my ribs, my, my, my jaw bones, my cheekbones, a couple of legs. But, but it, I survived. Come on. Michael. <laughs> Thank you, great to meet you. Great to meet you too, welcome to um, HQ. Wow, what a place. And Michael Acton-Smith, who wants his computer game for kids to turn him into the Walt Disney of the internet age. I think we can build a, a multi-billion dollar business here. You think we can go to multi-billion dollar? Absolutely. We call it a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. A BHAG? Exactly, yeah. I think that's... Uh, well, I don't quite know if I've met anybody that dreams quite as big as you. <laughs>